This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Daniel Jurgen, who is the author of a book, The Quest, Energy, Security, uh, and the Remaking of the Modern World. Dan, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Los Angeles and raised there. And looking back, how did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Well, I think uh, my father had been a newspaper reporter during part of his life, and that was always, I think, the most exciting part of his life. So I was raised on stories, on narrative. So it kind of always gave me a compulsion to be a writer, and I just started doing it. My mother uh, was a painter uh, and a sculptor, and I would watch her sketch, and I sometimes think, I, when I try and understand how do I write, which I don't exactly know how I do it, but I think of her sketching and I feel that's how I begin to shape my narratives. And uh, was there a lot of discussion around the dinner table about world uh, politics? Yeah, a lot of public, uh, a lot of it. I think when I would come home, I think it was on Wednesday, Time and Newsweek would arrive and when I was nine or ten I was already sort of, uh, I would just gobble up those magazines. And uh, did you have teachers as a, as a youngster? who sort of pushed you in the direction of writing uh, over and above what you were getting at home? I think so. Uh, you know, I think I it was always a kind of, a, I was good at it, and so I got reinforcement, and I, you know, I was, I was student body president of high school, but I was also editor of the literary magazine. And uh, I think back to the teachers who taught me certain things. I, I think back to a seventh grade teacher, Mrs. Gross, who really taught me how to diagram a sentence. Uh -huh. And I'm, 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 I believe strongly in diagramming, sentence diagramming, and then I had a 10th grade English teacher who really put a focus on transitions, and I think about those a lot of times. So I do go back to the lessons uh, that I learned in school. And where did you do your undergraduate education? I went to Yale. Yeah, and what did you major in there? Uh, I did basically English and history, and were the two main subjects I did, and the major was actually an English major. Mm -hmm. And then your graduate work? Well, the graduate work was in history and international relations at Cambridge University. I sometimes think in, in my uh, uh, undergraduate education, I saw the other day the, the professor who had been my sophomore teacher on the Victorian novel, and I sometimes think that the books I write have certain characteristics in common with the Victorian novels. We'll talk about your book in a minute, but, but that, the, the impression that I got from the book is that, the, your new book is that it's, it's an encyclopedia. It's, it's, as one reviewer said, it's five books, not one. But on the other hand, the, the power of the narrative is, uh, is that of a, a, a novel, basically. Well, I, I really, I mean, I've always been, I mean, narrative really matters to me. Storytelling really matters to me. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, I started a, a, a magazine called The New Journal, which was sort of the new journalism, which was long, lengthy pieces told, de dealing with events, but telling them in a narrative fashion. So it's, it's always been a deep interest. Mm -hmm. And what did you do your dissertation on? I did my dissertation on the origins of the Cold War. And uh, you moved from national security studies to energy. Was that transition easy because it happened before the fall of the Soviet Union yeah. so you're not one of those who lost your <laughs> the study yeah, the, of your subject yeah re recovering Sovietologists yes. no. uh, it was um, when I was finishing uh, my book Shattered Peace and my, my dissertation I had some stuff in there about oil and post World War II and then I had the uh, good fortune to have uh, two years of a postdoctoral grant where I wasn't closely supervised. Mm -hmm. And I was able to follow 
my own interests. I had started working on an aspect of Soviet American relations and detente was collapsing. It just wasn't that interesting. And I kind of became obsessed with what was happening in energy. And I had pursued as an academic a kind of a second track and professionally as a journalist. So I really started writing for serious magazines and educating myself about uh, oil and energy. And then kind of out of the blue was offered a job at the Harvard Business School, and I thought, well, they're not going to make that mistake again, so I better take it, and, and that's where I kind of really solidified things. Mm -hmm. And that was, so the transition happened over a period of about uh, five years. As your book reveals, uh, this is a very complex subject, uh, uh, and I'm curious what you see as the skills and the training to master a subject like this? What, what, what uh, advice can you give to students about, well, if you're going to really grapple with this subject of, of energy, you need to? Right. Well, I, I go back to two of my professors at Cambridge. Uh, one of them told me once that, you know, the kind of the s skill set that I had that was useful is the ability to synthesize and put pieces together. And the other, which was a form of advice, he said, when you're going to write your dissertation, you don't want to have a subject that's too small so it's not interesting, but not too big so you can't manage it to kind of find that middle ground. And so I think people have to f kind of find a subject that they can get their arms around. And you have to kind of passionately believe that it's what you're writing about is just about the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And, and I uh, guess there are other oh, things sure. too. No, please, yeah, please. I think about it, and I think about this as a writer. You do have to kind of make a deal with yourself, particularly if you write something over several years, that you're not going to just keep changing your mind, that you're going to accept the judgments you worked out and kind of move on, because otherwise you're in that position, and you know, I'm sure you've known academics too who are spent 30 years revising the same manuscript. Mm -hmm. Got to get to closure. And, and it, it seems that in, in the case of your books, the, the Prize on Oil, and then now this book, that uh, 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 history is very important to you. Uh, uh, and uh, geopolitics is very important. So it, 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 and obviously technology is very important. So it, it, it really involves uh, familiarity, if not mastery, of, of a number of, of academic subjects. Yeah, I think it does. It, it involves, it's, it is a synthesis of, a, across a, a range. And I mean, I've always, even though Shattered Peace was on a somewhat different subject, I think it was about clearly about geopolitics. And I think that's where I really learned how to write a, a long flowing narrative. Um, both of these books, however, uh, including The Quest, I thought, you know, there is a degree of, uh, of um, self-delusion because you set out thinking, oh, I can do this in a reasonable amount of time and I will be able to kind of shape the, the story and, you know, it's not going to be that hard. And then you find out that you've taken on the hardest project you've ever taken on in your life. Mm -hmm. you, is this book, The Quest, a book that could emerge out of a discipline? I mean, you are a an energy consultant. You're, uh, to my, you're, uh, you're not teaching now. No, I, I do uh, a week, uh, a year, like I go back to the Yale campus and teach there. And, and I, but I still feel, and I suppose in a way that you do, that you, you continue to be an educator, but you're just doing it in a non-traditional right. way. No, I guess what I'm saying is, would it, had you been trapped in a discipline, do you think you, you could have uh, mastered a subject like this, or is, is that a fair question? <laughs> well, I think it would have been uh, challenging. Uh, you know, somebody once said to me, where I didn't have an academic, where I didn't have an academic, after I didn't have an academic position, because I taught for you know number, several years at the business school at Harvard and at the Kennedy School. But he said, you know, it's good that you you know you weren't in a discipline because you would have never been able to write the prize. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how long did it take you to write the quest? A little over five years. And and how do you do it? If if I might ask. In other words, do you 
you identify the, 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 the topics the, the, which are, turn out to be trajectories that sort of meet some point in the, in the future, I think. Uh, uh, do you have a, I don't want to call it a formula, what's your working style? Well, I don't have a detailed uh, outline of where I'm going. I have a rough sense. Uh, again, there are a couple of rules. I mean, famous uh, journalist and historian David Halberstam says, you know, kind of a book leads you, and this book led me into places I didn't think I was going to go. The second thing I always think back to, uh, when I was in high school, I did an interview with a science fiction writer named Ray Bradbury, mm -hmm. and he said that writing is, he said, it, I, I, I looked at it, and I don't know whether he said it's playing out rope or pain out rope from the subconscious, that to some degree you depend upon some part of your mind in a way that's not totally conscious to provide an organization uh, to what you're doing. Nevertheless, I think uh, with the prize and with the quest, still at the beginning, there's a sense of, well, feeling frankly a little overwhelmed. I mean, what have I taken on? You know, what, what, what was I thinking? And uh, then I remember actually when I was writing the prize, I had a, a, a mentor at Harvard who said to me, I was sitting in his backyard with his wife and my wife and saying, you know, I don't kind of know how to get this going. And he said, very simple, don't start at the beginning. Start at the simplest place and do that. And uh, in both cases I did, I took chapters that had a very straight narrative, like a, a Roman road, and, um, and wrote them. And I said, and then looked at it and said, well, this looks like a chapter. I think I can, you know, I think I know how to do this. I've done this before. Um, and I, but I didn't do it in, you know, in the organization of the book. I just took chapters that were interesting or themes that was interesting, get my arm around it, get my arm around part of it, get that shaped, and then kind of move on to the next part and put what I've done out of my mind until I go back and see how it all fits together. And the, the, the book, I'll call it the book on climate change is a good example of that because here is uh, a problem that emerges that really impacts your subject matter. But, but you take us back in history uh, to say how we came to understand yeah, the problem. Yeah, because I did have, you know, there were, you know, a set of specific questions in my mind that I was, and one of them was, how did this issue of climate change, which actually is a very abstract question, it's not something you go out and touch, uh, how did it go from being something that a few scientists thought about to being this dominating political economic energy issue? And I thought, and this is a good example of, you know, material legion, I thought I'd write one chapter on it, I found I wrote six chapters. It's funny because somebody sent me an email saying, how come you didn't talk about, you know, they read the review or something, you didn't talk about climate change. I said, I have six chapters on climate change. Yeah. And so it did take me back to the Alps in the 1770s. And then it, in the 19th century, what I found so interesting was, a, and it is it's sort of, it is intellectual history, that, you know, Louis Agassiz and some other scientists figured out that actually there'd once been an ice age. And so the initial interest that people had in climate change was first they were obsessed with glaciers, not that they were going to melt, but terribly afraid that the glaciers were going to come back and obliterate civilization. And so it was kind of tracing that arc all the way to many people c cite the famous uh, Swedish scientist Arrhenius who uh, wrote about climate change. But he actually welcomed it because, you know, he was a depressed Swede in these <laughs> very long dark nights and he actually wanted a, a warmer, a more bountiful climate. And, and uh, as we talk about climate change, uh, this is a good case where, to demonstrate to the audience the, the power of your book, you, you do these uh, uh, short narratives about individuals, uh, Tyndall, was the the, the gentleman John, I, and the, John yeah John Dill uh, who was obsessed with glaciers yeah. basically now what what uh, this I mean there in the middle of the 19th century he'd go every year from Britain to yeah. to the Alps to climb these and uh, he almost got to the top of the Matterhorn and if he tried to go ahead through the storm he probably would have been killed mm -hmm. and and so does does this uh, one of the ways one I think can get a handle on your book is the the forces at work in energy. And, and one, you really believe that despite the fact we're dealing with a realm where technology and organization and capital are so important, there is always uh, 
uh, individuals yes. who make a difference and do something at a particular time and place that, that moves this trajectory along. Yeah, it is. I mean, partly from a narrative point of view, a storytelling point of view, you're always looking for the emblematic characters who carry the story because they played a crucial role. I didn't know about John Tyndall st until I started researching this, one of the great scientists in the 19th century. But let me give you a specific example that even goes back a little farther, because I was trying to think how to summarize the whole book. And then I read a, a, an essay, a quote, and it led me to read an essay about a man named Sadi Carnot. The engineers who are watching this will know this from the Carnot cycle, which kind of describes how a steam engine works. But he wrote in 1824 this, this paper about uh, what he called heat engines and combustibles. And it was very interesting, because he was not only a scientist and engineer, it turned out he was also a soldier. His father had been Napoleon's minister of war. And he was interested in the subject because he thought it was geopolitics. He thought Britain had bested France in these wars because it had the steam engine and he wanted to change the balance. But, he, but then he, uh, he said this is a great revolution. Up until the 18th century, it was human labor and animal labor, and that was it. But now humanity had gotten its, you know, how to harness energy. He called it a great revolution. And when I was one of the big challenges, how do you conclude a book like this, was to get this framework that a kind of a great revolution began in the 18th century, was still part of it, and it's going to continue for quite a long time. And, and just uh, because this climate change part of the book, which is just a, you know, a, a, just maybe a fifth of the book, if, if even that, but, but it, it really, I think, demonstrates again how you draw the reader in to tell this even more complicated story of the whole energy field. But, but the other interesting uh, person here is the scientist from the University of California, uh, Dr. Ravel, who was at San Diego and who really uh, put the focus on carbon and then went back to Harvard and taught Al Gore, right, who, exactly. who was very much influenced. In fact, it was fun to go back and in the archives of Scripps to find the notes from Ravel's lectures that uh, Gore sat through and to see. I mean, I, I am very interested in how these threads of history tie events together. And Ravel was clearly a incredibly forceful person in shaping sort of almost post-war U.S. science policy. But he was the one to force a personality who, who put it on the agenda, who in 1957 decided that maybe the oceans aren't absorbing all of the carbon. And then he went out and found a student who at Caltech who named Keeling who wanted to study carbon. And as Ravel said, he wanted to study carbon, and that's all he wanted to study. And, and what really is important in the, in the larger story that you're telling here is the, this, this focus and emerging consensus about climate change really has great uh, implications for the kind of energy system we have built and the kind we might want to build in, in the future. Right. And it is uh, part of the challenge and, you know, there kind of, it's one of the really three basic questions that tie the book together. How do you match the world's need for energy, for economic growth, for jobs, standard of living, with environmental objectives? And you look and you say how complex the system is that our economy rests on and doesn't change overnight. Mm -hmm. And, and let, let's look at that question because in the beginning of the book you define uh, three questions and, and let's uh, look at uh, those questions. One is, will there be enough energy to meet the needs of a growing world and at what cost and with what technology? Now, it, to characterize your book, and it's a hard thing to do, but I'll try to do it. You, you can you, say it's a good story. Yeah, yeah, it's a good story, but uh, yeah, I don't mean that. It, right, it's no, not a clear kidding. book. It, it's very lucid and so on. But but in a in a way, the the expectations or the negative narrative that might be out there, uh, for example, the problem of peak oil has to be weighed on the complexity of what's going on. And it seems to be an, the interface between technology, organization, uh, human creativity, so that and what- one, And one other thing, economics, markets. And markets. So, so though that the dynamic of those four uh, variables uh, require us to look at any assertion 
about where the energy world is going uh, uh, and not to prematurely come to the conclusion that we're not going to have enough energy. Right. That, uh, uh, I mean, it is a challenge because you, what you do see, particularly with what globalization means, what it means is standards of living going up in China. 17 million people buying cars last year in China when only 11 million bought them in the United States. So you have rising standards of living and that means rising levels of energy. And you say it's going to be a big challenge to uh, do it, but you know, it's, it's doable, uh, but things can go wrong as well. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in the end, you, in, in the, for example, in the uh, uh, oil, gas, uh, and energy field as we know it, uh, when you think you've reached the limits, uh, part of what's going on here is the, the entrepreneurs, the wild catter. Uh, you, you have a little uh, vignette about George Mitchell from Texas. Uh, uh, being obsessed with with uh, getting oil from uh, uh, shale rock, I think, uh, uh, a place where yeah. no one thinks you can yeah. extract uh, the yeah, oil. Yeah, exactly, and, and even more so natural gas is what he wanted to do. Yeah. It is very interesting, because I think a lot of the personalities in the book would be described as either tenacious, uh, very focused, or obsessive. <laughs> it depends how you, where you want to put it on that spectrum. But, uh, you know, one might argue that the biggest energy innovation in terms of scale and impact the last couple of decades is what's happened with shale gas. It's controversial, but the numbers are very large. And it really goes back to one guy uh, starting in the early 1980s. And uh, he, the guy, people working for him would say, George, you're wasting your money. Uh, George, you're crazy. This isn't going to work. And he'd say, uh, you know, maybe wasting the money, but it's my money. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to waste it. Mm -hmm. And it took 15 years to get to the first breakthrough and about another five years to get to the second breakthrough. And it was five years later before the world woke up to this. So you really say it was a 25 year period to get there, and one personality drove it. But it's just like uh, Keeling, uh, who was the expert on carbon, he was just tenacious about it. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, variable that you talk about is is really technology. So that the what the, the empowerment of computers allowed us to to do computer design, allowed us to do uh, uh, mapping, uh, 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 and use computers in a way to 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 find oil in places we didn't know. Yeah, that it, yeah, it is. Um, just the other day, I was hearing about this oil field that was discovered in Los Angeles in 1921 called Signal Hill that was considered finished, done. Technology, computer skills have opened up a whole new horizon there. So you keep seeing that happening, that uh, these tools, these modern tools of information technology that have been developed, uh, you know, are very a applicable and indeed the uh, oil and gas industry is one of the biggest consumers of um, information technology. Now, as you answer your, your three big questions, and we're just on the first one, uh, what uh, continually raises its head is, is politics, basically. Uh, and uh, whether you're talking about uh, 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 petrostates or whether you're talking about environmental movements that you know call into question uh, what BP is doing in the Gulf and so on. So, so this is a very important part of the dynamic. So you have extraordinary individuals, you have technology, but, but also uh, in the background is politics, which leads to both an abuse, uh, uh, in the case of Petro, uh, countries that squander their money uh, and, and threaten the, the world economy of energy on the one hand, but on the other hand, lead to movements that say, hey, the oil companies are going too far. You know, there aren't proper controls uh, with the BP spill in the Gulf. Yeah, well, politics surrounds the uh, energy business because of its, its size, uh, its scale, the amount of money that's involved, the amount of money that's invested, and because of its strategic significance, has always been a very central focus of governments, and is always a subject to politics, and often a subject to political contention. And and it, it's this the, the the politics 
works its way through the system, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad ways. Yes, uh, yeah, and it's, uh, and sometimes in surprising ways. I, I mean, um, 2011, at the beginning of 2011, I don't think anybody, probably any sort of intelligence agency or planning, you know, foresaw the Arab Spring in the way it came. And yet, this has now changed the strategic balance in a substantial part of the Middle East. And it's still going to unfold. And that has implications, obviously, for energy. And, and I guess your working assumption is that the system is pretty resilient, basically. Is that, is that fair? In other words, when you put these variables together, that we run up against major problems, some of them new problems, but, but we've got to factor in all these variables to, to, to see where we come out. I think that, um, uh, you know, I think the book ends and br brings it all together with kind of what I might call realistic optimism. The realism is to say there are real risks and you can see how things could go wrong in so many different dimensions. On the other hand, it is a very big system. There is a lot of ingenuity and creativity in it, and innovation now is something that comes all over the world, so we have a much larger pool of innovation to call upon. So I guess my operating assumption, and I spend some time in the book on energy security and risks and so forth, and I think they're very real, but I think that um, being prudent, they can be managed and you know build, as you said, to use your word, resiliency into the system so it can withstand the next crisis or the next shock. Uh, and you, you touched on this a, a moment ago, but it not, needs to be brought up in this context, and that is the, the, the whole business of the emerging economies and the demands that they're going to make on the system. And so then, then you immediately say, well, China is going to have these great demands, and is this going to lead to a new kind of geopolitical conflict? So, so as we move forward in time, we always have to ask questions that draw in these other realms. Yeah. Well, it is trying to, to some degree, look around the corner. And certainly, if you look around the corner, you see the potential for geopolitical clashes there. You see uh, signs of it in the argument about is the South China Sea a core interest of China? Uh, the U.S. Navy's presence in East Asia, China moving to have a blue water navy. They bought an aircraft carrier from Ukraine, actually, which Ukraine didn't need an aircraft carrier. Uh, uh, you, you see the Chinese president expressing concern about the security of flows through and China's vulnerability, because this is new to China to be dependent. So I think that's there, and I, as I read what Chinese and Americans say about their navies, and you're aware of nationalism in countries, you know, you hear echoes of the Anglo-German naval race, which, uh, which certainly helped lay the ground for conflict in August of 1914. So I think with those things in mind is to say, well, how do you manage against that? And on the other side of the table is, in fact, that the U.S. and China have common interests in a, um, a stable oil market. They have common in interests in access to supplies. Uh, and they have common interests in a healthy global economy. And by the way, they have common interests in their relations with each other, because it is the most important relationship the two countries have in the 21st century. And so all of those have to be activated to kind of keep things in context so they don't fester, so you don't either have a buildup of tensions or an accident that kind of puts you into a different frame of reference. Uh, as somebody who's mastered this field, do you, what conclusions do you draw about the, the this tension between global governance, uh, the, the efforts, for example, to reach a climate change agreement, which got stymied at a certain point, but you know, moved along at a slow pace on the one hand, but then the old realist notion of, hey, this is going to lead to your, your uh, old the, professor yeah, Walsh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so do you do you what what viewer you left with uh, with regard to that well, dilemma? And you know, I think um, if we went back before September 11th, 2001, I think there looked back on the 90s, there was this kind of 
sense of easy globalization, that it was all just going to happen, and people talked about a borderless world, and uh, it's all going to be markets. And I think uh, since the beginning of the new century, we're, we're reminded of the, the importance of nation states and the role of nation states and sovereignty. Now, the Europeans have their own particular experiment that is unfolding right now. But uh, nation states continue to be very important, even as economies do get more closely linked. And you have supply chains that you know cross many borders and cross oceans. And and also the other thing that's happened, of course, is that communications, the fact that communications is so cheap uh, or virtually free, and the internet. I mean, so we're still in a period of change. But I think uh, the nation state is. Um, is going to remain, and so it's really a question of, of nations agreeing on rules of the game uh, about how the world will will function. Your, your second major question that, that you posed uh, overarching the book is, how can the security of the energy system on which the world depends be protected? So, so security remains a, uh, a, a problem as we saw uh, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, uh, the Iraq War. Right. Well, uh, and also the Gulf crisis in uh, 1990, 1991, uh, with Saddam's bid to absorb Kuwait and kind of dominate the region. It's certainly there today surrounding the role of Iran. There are any number of countries around the Gulf where there's a clash of interest between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's uh, obviously and most importantly Iran's nuclear program which you know no one doubts is or few doubt is uh, aimed eventually at least having a nuclear weapon capability and the consequence of that at the very least will probably could well be a nuclear arms race in that region that's a you know a, a sobering thought uh, there's terrorism al-Qaeda uh, and then uh, there's also just in the Middle East is this youth bulge. What's going to happen to, uh, uh, how will these systems adapt to it? But there are other things. Piracy has actually become quite a big issue. And uh, that really takes collaboration of the major consuming countries, including the United States and China. Uh, and then there's the integrity of our electric power system we depend upon. And, um, Which raises issues of cybersecurity. Exactly, and that's yeah. what I was going to get to. Uh, just when I was finishing the book, uh, Sony uh, went through a very bad cyber attack, cost the company, it said, $170 million. And the uh, CEO of Sony said, welcome to the bad new world of cyber vulnerability. And you know the, those attacks are going on every day. So um, you know people are trying to understand and where the vulnerabilities are, but uh, new vulnerabilities keep getting discovered. So you know. You have to, again, manage for the future. And, and in the case of nuclear power, which is a piece of this story, uh, you, you have uh, two vulnerabilities that, that I can think of. One is obviously the proliferation problem, where uh, using nuclear energy can position you to, 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 uh, to become a, 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 a nuclear power uh, and a proliferator. Uh, on the one hand, and the other is the the, the recent accident in in uh, Japan, where the the inability to secure the facilities there uh, from the attack of nature, not from yeah, terrorists. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And it was it, it, you know I read a report by the Japanese government. One of their first reports that came out said, you know, we always we did incredibly intense, detailed work to understand earthquakes. But on tsunamis, tsunamis, we depended upon fables. Mm -hmm. You know, I just thought that was a really arresting mm. statement. It was a kind of classic case of, of, of not thinking, failing to think the unthinkable or the semi-thinkable. There had been that terrible tsunami in 2004 in uh, Southeast Asia. And the, the Fukushima accident was a result primarily not of the earthquake, but of the tsunami disabling the backup electric power system that was necessary when the power grid went down to keep the, to keep the uh, nuclear core cool. And you know, in retrospect, people, it's such a tragic accident, people say, how could we not have thought about that? But apparently they didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. you, you, you are uh, 
enthralled in your storytelling by human imagination, the, the way that you can see things differently. And, and I'm curious, uh, beyond individuals, wh where do you see the, the, uh, the Cassandras, the voices that say, hey, wait a minute, what about this problem that, that's not being identified? I, 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 you know, in other words, do, should we look to governments to be the check on, for example, uh, the Japanese not seeing uh, the part of the story yeah. that was very important? Should we look to environmental movements? Should we look to governments? Or should we look to the market to, to solve to, that to, kind to, of, or, yeah. Or, to, or put a price on yeah. risk. I guess it's all of the, the above. Uh, it's interesting now you're making me think about the book a little differently because maybe there is this general, as you say, optimism and deep interest in creativity and how ideas turn into very tangible things that change the world. But there is a kind of voice of Cassandra that also runs through the book. It was a, you know, a, an unnamed character throughout <laughs> the book. You know, warning of risks and dangers that you know, need to be thought about. You know, in some ways, I always thought, even going back to my first book on the Cold War, that one thing, people rarely get credit for the crisis that they averted by being prescient and looking down, uh, looking d down the road. It's afterwards, people go back. Um, uh, I always remember, you, you may have read it, the three-volume history of Pearl Harbor by Gordon Prang. Mm -hmm. Uh, magisterial work, and at the end he said, well, you know, after this, this was his life work, why did Pearl Harbor happen? And he said the most important reason that the attack on Pearl Harbor happened is because people never thought it could happen. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, uh, being prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And you know, <laughs> obviously your book, you, you write this book, and uh, as you're, you're coming to, I guess, finishing the project, and what do we get? We get the Arab Spring, uh, not because of your book, okay. but I mean, these events just uh, roll themselves out. You get uh, 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 Katrina, uh, you get uh, uh, the, the Fukushima, Yuba, the, Fukushima, Fukushima, and so on. So uh, uh, it, it's as if uh, the importance of the topic, I guess, is revealed by the extent to which you know, crises that were not well, anticipated. Well, as a, exactly, as I was getting to the end of the book, here these two things happen simultaneously in halfway around the world. You have the, the terrible tsunami in Japan and the Fukushima accident, and you have the Arab, the unfolding of the Arab Spring. And I thought, in a way, these events are proving the thesis of my, of my book. Mm -hmm. uh, they're showing how events come together and uh, how important they are in terms of energy and how important that is to our world and how it kind of, in ways that we don't expect, uh, to use the, you know, reshapes, as the subtitle, reshapes the world. And uh, it's an ongoing process. And so I ended up deciding that that's where I should start the book because that really makes it vivid and it's just a kind of irony of history that uh, these two things happened halfway around the world. and yet both of them were so important for energy and for the, our future. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, factors that seem very important and kind of relevant to your third main topic, which will what will be the in impact of environmental concerns, including climate change, on the future of energy and how will energy developed affect the environment? That is, looking at the problem of, of transition to things like renewables in light of uh, the problem with climate change. And, and I, I guess what I want to, I want to put a, a negative factor on the table, which is crony capitalism. Uh, we see it in the petro states. Uh, we see it in uh, the resistance of organizations to adapting to the new world over and above organizational constraints, that is, the requirements of capital and, and, and so on. So, so talk a little about that. I mean, what, what are the, the, what is the primary hurdles you see in moving to a new world that, that accepts the reality of, of climate change and overcomes the resistance of entrenched interests? Well, I think it's having a better mousetrap. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you have answers that can work at scale and are, you know, relatively economically c competitive. That's why, you know, the picture I think will be very interesting to people 
to read how I talk about renewables because I call that section when I begin it the rebirth of renewables. And what are you talking about? Well, the modern renewable industry sort of burst on the scene in the 70s and the 1980s. And then it went into what people called the valley of death, those who survived. They were hanging on because the economics, the technology. Looking back, you realize it was very immature technology compared uh, to this rebirth that started around the time of the new century where you have bigger scale. Uh, a wind turbine today is a much more sophisticated and a much larger device than a wind turbine in the 1980s. And so there's a kind of evolution of technology that it gets broad enough shoulders that it can really support the kind of hopes that people have. And, and what is, the, will there be a resistance to these new technologies by powerful interests or will they buy into the transi uh, transition when they see there's profit to be made and well, it's doable? Well, I think you've, you've certainly seen energy companies, electric utilities go into the wind business and wind has been, you know, the biggest thing out there. Uh, a lot is goes back to your questions about politics because the way, at least in the United States, we tend to do things is with mandates. Uh, the state will say 20 or California now says 33 percent of your electricity has to be renewable by 2020. 2020 is not far away in mm -hmm. energy terms. Or, uh, or the Congress will say 10 percent to some percent of gasoline has to be ethanol. And then people respond to that and that creates uh, markets and you get changes in markets going to that. And so, you know, that sets a signal. It's not a price signal, but it's a, a mandate signal. Mm -hmm. Which raises the question in dealing with the problem of renewals, new sources of energy, uh, is, a, is a state uh, like the United States better position than a state like China, which is a, you know, is a, uh, uh, is a very different kind of, of capitalism. In, in other words, a d and in a terms of... And a different kind of decision making. Yeah, yeah. So, so who is better positioned to bet on the future and implement the future? Well, I think that it's, um, again, it's not a kind of either or. I don't you know, some people worry that the Chinese may have more wind turbines eventually than we do. I don't know that that affects us. I mean, the Chinese are, look, at they need electricity. They're going to use more coal, they're going to use more gas, and they're going to use more renewables, and they're going to use more hydropower. I had this conversation that's in the book with uh, one of the senior Chinese officials. He talked about these sh huge wind that they have in the northwest of the country. And he said, we used to regard those winds as a natural disaster. Now we regard them as a precious resource mm. and sort of harnessing them. Uh, the Chinese do have advantages. They can do things quickly. They're, people talk about China time. They do things faster. And they do have this advantage in low-cost manufacturing. And they are a growth market, so people want to be there. And the Chinese are very good about getting people to come there. But you have to share your technology. You have to do joint ventures. You have to train Chinese companies as well. Uh, we have the advantage is that we are a very uh, somewhat disorderly, innovative, creative society uh, where being an entrepreneur if, has always been a high value, but it's even a much higher value. I see so many young people who are three or four years out of college now uh, who want to be entrepreneurs, start businesses. You know, I think you can think back, uh, you know, in earlier years, this was not a mm -hmm. high value. <laughs> But it's the you know it's the it's the legend of Steve Jobs that um, kind of motivates people or uh, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin that you too can do it and so I mean this is kind of a, uh, a a shifting of the American dream and so I think that plus the capacity that we have in our universities and the creativity and the diversity so I think those are really great advantages that we have. Uh, as a as a former professor, what what grade do you give the Obama administration in 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 the in terms of the programs to position the United States for an energy well, future? Since I'm on the Secretary of Energy's advisory board, I think I will avoid. A, <laughs> we'll go to a pass fail system. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I think that uh, 
clearly no president, as I write in the Quest, has made renewable energy and new technologies so central to his uh, energy portfolio. What we see now is a kind of a recognition, though, that this ingenuity and creativity applies to conventional resources, too. And so you also see the president talking about 100 years of natural gas supply because of shale gas, because of that famous, now famous word, fracking. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what, what, ha how should we view, for example, the, the environmental uh, opposition to the Trans-Canada uh, 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 pipeline, which would bring this uh, tar pits oil to the United States? I think they call it oil sands. Oil oh, sands. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Tar, uh, the tar pit. I remember the La Brea tar pits when I grew up in Los Angeles, sorry. where you saw the where they found this, the fossils of the of the dinosaurs. Right. Too too much to learn in your book. Yes. I, I, uh, so the, the, in in the case of the United States, it would seem uh, a healthy dialogue is possible on you know, tweaking that or changing the course of that pipeline. Whereas if, if we compare that with China, that's a place where, you know, uh, environmental current concerns clearly they, they are just, having difficulty yeah, working through the system. Through. Or what you do get now, you get sort of local protests, which the Chinese leadership now pays more and more attention to. Uh, they pay a lot of attention to what's in the internet and because of those protests. I mean, China will come back to the pipeline, but China, with its growth has come enormous pollution problems that make the smog of Southern California seem mild by comparison. And the Chinese know they have to address those questions. They're all breathing that air. And with a growing middle class, is unwilling to accept that, what it means for people's health and the health of their children. Uh, on the Keystone XL pipeline, it is, I think, become, this is the pipeline that would bring oil sands. I tend to look at it first from an energy security point of view. I find so often people think that we import all of our oil from the Middle East, but actually 25% comes from Canada. That oil sands is a big part of that. And so this is oil that would come by pipeline, not by tanker. It meets the uh, criteria of diversification. And we have a lot of pipelines. Uh, in the prize, I write about the big inch and the little inch pipelines that were built hurriedly during World War II. And if we failed to build those pipelines, it might well have affected the course of the war because the United States, six out of every seven barrels that the Allies used came from the U.S., primarily from the Southwest, and the Nazi U-boats were sh sh sinking the tankers. And so the pipelines were really a security. So I s kind of start off with that perspective and think that the environmental questions that the Canadians are uh, you know, I, I do find when I talk to Canadians, they get kind of very upset with the argument in the United States because there are two arguments. One, that it's a wild north and there's no regulation. And two, that the Canadians don't care about the environment. Canadians, you know, have very environmentally oriented and it's, it's a probably even as highly or more highly regulated society than the United States. So, you know, it isn't, it isn't the wild north. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the environmental questions, like all environmental questions, you address them with technology and prudent policies and so forth. But I think it would be a, you know, a big contribution to our energy security and uh, also to the flexibility of markets. And if, you know, if it doesn't get built, then that oil will go to China. Well, one of the stories you tell in the book is the, 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 the way technology and the organization of, and capital of the uh, oil companies push them into seeing the possibilities of of the deep sea uh, oil reserves. Uh, what, what, as a result of the BP spill, uh, what should we be looking for in terms of tapping this resource on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, making the market responsible right. and the organization well, responsible? Well, I think that, um, you know, there's still, uh, I mean, as the government has done a number of studies and there's still, you know, argu you know, argument, was there a generic problem, was it a specific problem? But uh, meanwhile, 30% of world oil comes from the offshore. Um, the, the rest of the world has just kind of marched on. And in the United States, we have a new uh, safety regime, more rigorous, and also now, because people didn't think this accident could happen, uh, 
uh, and so they, you know, they had to improvise the solution, and so now the capacity is there to deal with it. I mean, one prays that an accident like this will never happen again and should not happen again because processes are different. But if it does, you have to have the capability to deal with it quickly. And that was, you know, after the tragic loss of life, it was the other thing was it took so long to do it. So I think that capacity appears to be there now. And what you see is, you know, kind of ratcheting up at, in terms of permitting, but under rigorous uh, regulation. But, you know, you say something about technology and, uh, and environmental problems. One of the wonderful stories I have in the book, and I feel it because I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up, I had three newspaper routes, and I, I, it hurt my lung. I remember to throw a newspaper, it would feel pain in the lungs. The smog problem seemed insurmountable. And uh, one of those characters I talk about, a uh, uh, professor at Caltech named Ari Hagen Smith, who was trying to discover what the, figure out what the, how the flavor in pineapples, actually he was a man who discovered the active agent in uh, marijuana, but he came out uh, on a, in 1948 and he couldn't breathe that stinking cloud, and so he started, figured out what smog was. He became known as the father of smog, which always irritated him because he said, well, who's the mother of smog <laughs> then? But he, uh, what, he started the chain that led to basically, when I was in LA the other day, I thought, I, this days, like the, I remember the best days of my childhood, the air was so clear, much bigger population, more cars. I mean, the solutions were technology, figure out what the problem is and solve it. It took a couple of decades to do it, mm -hmm. but you know, there are environmental externalities. When people moved to California after World War II, they came for the beautiful air, these soft, you know, sunny days, and, uh, and then were betrayed by this awful smog. But the problem got solved, and so, you know, it's kind of looking for the, you know, what are the solutions to those specific environmental questions? If uh, if you were to advise students about how they should prepare uh, for the future after they've bought and read the prize and the quest, uh, what, what advice would you give them if if they wanted to be involved in? you know, in, in the processes of this energy world? Well, I think it's to kind of combine kind of a broad view, uh, understanding of the kind of, what you talk about, the political and social dynamics, uh, where this fits into geopolitics, with the kind of uh, technical knowledge, at least a, if, even if they're not going into science and engineering, at least a, a, an understanding of the main principles of how it works and how all these pieces fit together. I mean, in a way, I guess as I, you know, you kind of write a book and then at the end you say, what's it about, what did I do? You know, because you got to go from the implicit to the explicit. And one of the things is what I tried to do is put all these pieces together. And so I think that, you know, making sure that you, that you aren't just in one part of the, in one quadrant, but that you have a broad view of the politics and some understanding of the economics at the same time. Uh, an understanding of uh, the technology and the environmental questions. One final question, is, is there some nugget of wisdom that one could draw from your intellectual od odyssey, from history, Soviet studies, to uh, the Cold War, to, uh, to energy? Well, I think it is, uh, I'm driven by the, I think by the power of curiosity, I, I mean, I feel I'm working for the readers. I'm figuring things out for myself uh, by writing and studying them and then kind of sharing them with uh, other people. And I suppose that uh, to do a work like this, I share uh, a characteristic with uh, a number of the people that I write about, which is uh, tenacity. Because when you're in the middle of it, you kind of say, you know, you don't actually see where the end is. And then eventually, you don't actually finish a book, as the famous saying is, your, your publisher takes it away from you. <laughs> that's more or less what happened to me, in a very nice way. Well, on that note, let me show your book one more time. And I think everybody will want to go out and read it. And uh, thank you very much, thank Dan, you. for Pleasure. coming on our program. Pleasure to be here. Thank and you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Thank you.